welcome to another episode of the Shark Cast on litigation risks management, where we explore why businesses are so frequently sued and how to mitigate and navigate the dangers lurking in these risky waters. Join us now as we welcome our host, Kent Schmidt, litigation partner at the law firm of Dorsey and Whitney. Thank you for joining us today for what I trust will be an informative discussion on the issues companies routinely face when evaluating insurance coverage for certain types of commercial litigation. And then if there is insurance coverage, working with the insurer to manage the litigation to a successful conclusion. And as I encounter these issues with clients and in my practice over the last two plus decades, I've routinely reached out to my partner, longtime friend and mentor, Skip DeRocher. So I thought it would be a great idea to have Skip Join us on an episode of this podcast to talk about insurance coverage litigation. So welcome, Skip. Uh, So great to have you as a guest on the podcast. Hey, thank you, Kent. I'm looking forward to talking to you today. As long as we've worked together on various matters, including insurance, I don't think I've ever um, heard you explain how you initially got into insurance coverage. Uh, Is there a story that uh, some particular case or something that piqued your interest uh, on insurance coverage and has resulted in this storied uh, career and extensive expertise? Sure. Uh, you know, I actually started out doing reinsurance work. And for those of you who haven't heard of it, reinsurance is basically insurance for insurance companies. And on my very first day of practice, I started out with a large uh, uh, national firm in Chicago. Uh, back in 1987. Um, first day in the office, I walked into my mentor's office to get my first assignment. And he uh, he asked me if I knew anything about reinsurance. And I said, no. And he said, well, have you ever heard of reinsurance? And I said, no. And he said, you think you can spell it? And <laughs> I gave it a good shot. I'm not sure if I got it spelled correctly or not. Uh, but in any event, he said, congratulations, you're now a reinsurance lawyer. <laughs> and, and so we, uh, we, we had a lot of very interesting reinsurance issues for a client at the time. Uh, and that reinsurance work then sort of just uh, evolved into insurance coverage work gen- uh, generally at that firm. And then when I joined Dorsey in 1990, there were just a few people uh, here, a couple of partners who were doing insurance coverage work. And uh, really no associates. So uh, I jumped right in and, uh, and started uh, doing that work. And uh, now I'm one of the more senior guys here that, uh, uh, that handles coverage work. So I uh, think to sort of frame our conversation, be helpful to walk through in a somewhat chronological fashion, how these insurance issues arise. And the beginning uh, issue that we face is examining the policy and tendering the claims. Uh, What are some of the issues that you need to um, work with clients on in grappling with those threshold matters of evaluating coverage and tendering the claim? Sure. Well, the the very first thing uh, is to remember that you have insurance. Uh, You know, and I've learned now in my practice over the years, the first two questions I ask as a litigator when I'm contacted uh, by a client who's been sued is, one, have you notified your carriers, looked at your policy and notified your carriers? And two, have you issued a litigation hold? And you know, we, we won't talk about litigation hold today, but that's a, another essential question. But, uh, but the other question that you have to ask is, have you looked at your policy and, and tendered, tendered a, a claim uh, or given notice? And um, and, and so that's the first thing you have to think about is, is do you have a possible coverage situation here? Uh, if you do, um, the next step is figuring out the right policy. You know, there may be multiple policies that all could possibly provide coverage. Um, and uh, so you've got to sort through them, uh, perhaps with the help of, of your broker, uh, if you have a sophisticated broker or uh, outside counsel, um, or maybe you have a risk manager inside that, that can assist with that. And then, you know, another, another uh, thing you've got to keep in mind is identifying the right policies um, uh, to notify. Uh, and I don't mean just different types of coverage, but which policy uh, for a particular kind of coverage, uh, because 
you can have, there's two basic kinds of coverage, claims made coverage and occurrence uh, uh, coverage or occurrence policies. And claims made is just what it sounds like. The policy that is triggered that you would put notice on uh, is the policy uh, that's in place, that's in effect at the time the claim is made. But there's also occurrence policies and an occurrence policy, uh, if a claim comes in and it triggers an occurrence policy, it's, if it would be covered by an occurrence policy, what you would do is you'd be putting notice on the policy that was in place at the time the occurrence took place that gives rise to a claim that could be, you know, years, years later, uh, you know, for example, in like a pollution environmental claim. So you got to figure out not just, you know, what coverages you might have, but then which policies might be triggered. And then in those instances where you have layers of policies that can, we probably won't have time to get into this, but the insurers end up having indemnity claims against one another uh, often over who goes first in terms of stepping up to the plate and providing coverage. Absolutely. There's a, most policies will have something called an other insurance clause, uh, which says, you know, in certain instances, somebody else's policy may take precedence over my policy. Uh, uh, So if you have uh, uh, two or three different policies, all that could potentially provide coverage, there may be a fight amongst the insurance companies as to who has to go first and who has got to provide the defense. Uh, so yeah, that, that would be uh, something that we could spend a whole uh, uh, podcast on. Uh, uh, I know we're just going to touch the surface on some of these issues, but, but the key is identifying all of those possible coverages and, and then putting out a notice uh, to the various carriers. And, you know, the, there's different schools of thought on who should provide that notice um, that was going to be my next question. Oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, you know, my, my own personal view is if you've got a decent broker, I prefer to let the broker send out the notice. They are the most familiar with your schedule of insurance and the types of coverage. And, you know, there can be consultation uh, amongst the insured, uh, and particularly if that insured has a risk manager or somebody in the finance group who's knowledgeable about insurance. Uh, they may have their own ideas of which policies are triggered, but there should definitely be a conversation with the broker who set up the program. Um, and then in addition, if you have trusted outside counsel uh, that does insurance work, um, you can bring them into the equation too. And any one of those entities or persons can be the one to provide the coverage or the notice. Uh, it can be the insured itself can send out the notice. Uh, the broker can, or the outside counsel could. Um, Typically, you would look to the policy itself as to what information is needed. It'll usually spell out what kind of information you're supposed to provide when you provide notice of a, of a claim or of a possible claim. Um, my own personal preference is let's um, uh, you know let's have the broker send it out and uh, send out that notice again because they probably are the most knowledgeable. They're part of their their job. Uh, oftentimes, is to provide claims assistance. And, you know, just on a, on a little bit of a selfish, uh, you know, uh, uh, note, it, I, I would rather the broker do it because they have e coverage for exactly the kind of, you know, mistake they might make if they didn't provide notice to all the right entities. So um, they will be very careful and hopefully they'll get everybody right. And if they, uh, you know, to the right uh, uh, folks to, to contact, but if there is a failing, then you can always look to, uh, uh, the broker to to make that right. So I think it's implied in our con- conversation about the importance of tendering a claim early. But can yeah. you just touch on the consequences? If we'll we'll go ahead and blame the broker since you opened the door <laughs> there. If the broker uh, tendered one a, a, a claim to one insurer, but forgot that there's another policy that was in place that may provide coverage and just failed to deliver the, the, the claim or to tender the claim to that insurer. And then the insurer were, were a year into the litigation, the insurer gets the claim. What's the typical response of the insurer in that situation on insurance policy number two? Yeah, they, they usually uh, uh, have an argument uh, that they should not have to provide any defense costs for anything that's incurred prior to notice. And uh, that's that's pretty much across the board. Uh, insurance law is generally covered by each different state. Each state has its own 
uh, both statutory and common law that applies to the insurance issues that come up within that state. And different states differ, uh, deal with late notice differently. Um, but, the, but one thing that's pretty consistent is that insurers will not compensate you or reimburse you for defense costs or other costs that you incur prior to the time you send notice. Now, if you get a notice in uh, and then you start, you have to go out and defend yourself while you're waiting to hear from the insurance company, you should be okay. Uh, if it takes them a month to get back to you, two months to get back to you, you've got to take steps to protect yourself in the meantime. But it, uh, but if until you send out that notice, carriers will, and the policies usually state that they will not be obligated to pay any defense costs or certainly any settlement that you'd enter into without their prior knowledge and consent. So, uh, and then some states will uh, will will also uh, have some laws that will say in the event that you provide too late of notice that causes prejudice to the insurance company, uh, that there is that that may end up being a breach of the policy and give the insurance company an opportunity to not have any cover to, to provide any coverage under the policy. So uh, that that's really more uh, state by state uh, as to how, uh, how how that that'll happen, but uh, but it's certainly a risk uh, that you could by failing to timely notify the insurance company. Uh, that, that they may have a basis for denying coverage altogether. All right. Well, that's a very timely and important uh, recommendation on uh, promptly tendering the, uh, the the policy to the insurers. Now, let's step uh, forward in the next uh, uh, phase of the process, which is getting a response from the insurer. And the response is going to fall either in good news, there's coverage, or Bad news, we're denying coverage, and but perhaps uh, some in between as well. Um, so what are the typical uh, issues that arise in getting that initial response from the insurer? Sure. Uh, so notice goes out. Uh, you're waiting for the insurance company to get back to you. Like I said, you should protect yourself in the meantime. If you have to retain counsel, uh, file a, an answer to a complaint, uh, take other steps to protect yourself, you know, issue that litigation hold. Uh, but uh, at some point, you hopefully will hear back from the insurance company. And as you said, it's probably going to be one of three things. Uh, rarely, but off, you know, once in a while, you'll get a, a confirmation that they are going to provide coverage with no reservation. You know, they're going to, and, and maybe if they have a duty to defend, they'll appoint counsel themselves and counsel will defend the claim. And if there's a judgment against you or there's going to be a settlement, the insurance company just steps up and pays. Uh, that's fantastic. And in those instances, I usually don't have to get involved. Um, the, uh, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, an insurance company can uh, it would just deny coverage outright. And uh, uh, if that happens, they'll typically do that in writing. Sometimes they'll hire counsel to write that letter. Sometimes they'll, uh, they'll write it in-house and they will typically uh, lay out the facts as they understand the claim. They'll a lot of times the way they do these letters is they'll list the various parts of the policy that uh, that justifies in their mind uh, the denial. And uh, and then at the end of the letter, say, uh, for all the foregoing reasons, uh, we don't believe there's any coverage and uh, therefore we must deny coverage. And uh, and then the the middle ground, as you say, the in between is there's a, a letter with a reservation of rights and typically those types of letters will say, uh, we've reviewed the coverage or the, the facts and the coverage. And while there may not be coverage at the end of the day, uh, either for defense and or indemnity, uh, based upon what we know right now, we're not going to say no. Uh, we are going to go ahead and defend you, uh, but we are reserving our rights to either withdraw that defense or to not indemnify you in the event there's a judgment or a, a settlement uh, down the road. Uh, how often do I've had it happen in my uh, practice where an insurer would just sort of change their mind about halfway through the litigation. It's not some bad fact that came out that recharacterized the claim that moved it over into an excluded category. Maybe it's just a change of personnel. In fact, I think that what that was the situation in that case where they just stepped in and said, you know, uh, so-and-so has taken over the file and we looked at it and we're not providing coverage anymore. How often does that happen? Uh, not not terribly often. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say 
either way, it doesn't happen terribly often that that either they start out by saying uh, we are going to cover and then change their mind halfway through, uh, or or vice versa, where they start out saying uh, uh, we're we're not going to cover, and then at some point you perhaps provide them with additional information and you get them to change their mind and 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 provide coverage, uh, either defense or indemnity coverage. But it doesn't mean it never happens. And I've had both situations happen. And that's, uh, uh, it can be a, a welcome surprise or a, an, an awful disappointment for the client, uh, uh, you know, uh, depending on which way they, they change their mind. But, uh, um, and, and, you know, and then you're forced with, uh, you know, to, to make some, some hard decisions if they, if they kind of, you know, pull out uh, their defense uh, on you in the middle of the case and leave you hanging, um, that's, that's a dangerous, you know, uh, uh, way to handle that from the insurance company standpoint, uh, because they are leaving you hanging oftentimes. And perhaps you even are in a situation where you can't afford to continue the defense yourself. Um, so a lot of times if they are going to take that step to deny either right off the blocks or sometime during the, uh, the litigation, a lot of times that'll be accompanied with a declaratory judgment action that they'll file a, a DJ uh, asking a court to confirm that they no longer have a duty to defend uh, and or indemnify. Um, if they don't bring that action, then you've got and, and they, they change their mind midway through like they did with you and say they're no longer going to provide coverage for whatever reason. Um, and they don't file a DJ action that gives you the option to, uh, to, to file a DJ action right away and a breach of contract action, actually, um, uh, to try to get coverage uh, established again. Um, or you, if you're in a position to do so, I, I suppose you could also just continue to defend the, the case yourself, uh, wait to see how it all plays out, and then sue them after the fact. You got to keep in mind, of course, there are the statute of limitations, which typically will start running when they tell you they uh, no longer have a duty to defend or indemnify, because that would be the, the breach that would uh, cause the statute to start running. So as we follow this flow chart of possible scenarios, if there's a denial of coverage and we believe there's strong evidence and, and very good arguments that there is coverage, denial is, is improper, then there's a coverage lawsuit, and or we think they're actually right, and we think we don't have a good argument, in which case we just say, no surprise, nothing gained, nothing lost. If you get that denial letter and you read it, then maybe you have outside counsel read it, uh, um, or your broker. A lot of times, uh, you know, people turn to their broker, and, you know, well, the one caution I'd give there is, don't assume that your conversations with your broker are going to be privileged because they likely will not be. Uh, uh, you know, the the, the broker uh, is not your counsel. And so you just have to be careful about what you put in writing uh, and, you know, and getting their coverage analysis where they look at a denial letter and say, yeah, there's no coverage here. Uh, that can be discoverable down the road. So you got to keep that in mind. But um, but in any event, you, you can look at that denial letter and and Perhaps you decide, yeah, they're right. Uh, so at that point, you know, why throw good money after bad? Uh, you just uh, figure out another way to defend the lawsuit or to do what you need to do to protect yourself. Um, but you can also uh, look through that letter and perhaps push back. So even before you file a, a coverage action, um, typically the denial letter will say, if we got any facts wrong or if you otherwise believe there's a basis for coverage, don't, you know, please let us know right away. And you know, take them up on that because I've done that on occasion, and I've actually gotten insurance companies to change their mind uh, from a denial to at least a reservation of rights. So, um, so that's another option. And then the third option, as you say, is um, at some point you may have to file an action uh, to, uh, to to affirm coverage, and you'd, you'd seek a, a declaratory judgment, and but also allege breach of contract, and perhaps uh, if the law allows for it, a bad faith claim that you've been treated by the insurance company in bad faith. All right, great, great reminders. Well, let's let's follow the other branch of the tree, which is there's coverage, and let's assume it's the typical uh, positive response, which is a coverage, but with a reservation of rights. What are some of the issues that we're going to deal with right off the bat um, now that there's coverage? Uh, the fine print, so to speak, is there's coverage, but sure, yeah. Yeah, and there's and there's a whole host of issues that can come up. You know, one is um, 
do they, does the insurance company have a duty to defend or is it a policy that only requires them to reimburse you for ex, you know, the expenditure of defense costs? So you need to look at the policy and figure out what kind of, of, of policy it is in that regard, because that, that may impact other things like who gets to select counsel. Um, you know, in a duty, typical duty to defend policy, the insurance company has the contractual right to select counsel and then, of course, the, to pay for that counsel. Um, and uh, and that, that can be a great thing because there's no dispute about, uh, you don't have to get involved in the dispute about whether counsel's rates are appropriate, uh, whether they spend too much time on a, on a, uh, on a matter, uh, those sorts of things. But uh, the, the, the downside is that oftentimes the, the, the lawyers who are selected by the insurance company um, you have no relationship with them. They may not be familiar with your company. Um, you may not have the, you know, the, the highest uh, trust uh, in that, that law firm. Uh, you may be worried that are there allegiances or, or loyalties more to the insurance company uh, who may be hiring them for time and time again uh, versus the loyalty and, and, and you know, uh, acting in your best interest. Now, you know, you want to believe that all lawyers act, uh, uh, in the best interest of their clients. And I think most do, but that is a, a concern that comes up. Um, so, but, but if it's a, a duty to reimburse policy uh, and you have the right to select counsel, maybe it's, it's counsel. Sometimes they have a panel counsel. They have a list of counsel from whom you can pick. Uh, sometimes it's, you can pick whoever you want, but it's subject to their approval and subject to the particularly approval on rates. And, uh, uh, you know, you and I, I think, have gotten into to fights with insurance companies when uh, uh, our clients want to, you know, use Dor Dorsey or some other firm with whom they have a long relationship. And we go back to the insurance company and say, uh, OK, uh, we, we, we have the right to select counsel. Here's our counsel of choice. And, you know, a lot of times the insurance company will come back and say, hey, that's fine. Uh, we're happy to you know let you pick your own counsel. But the bad news is that. Uh, we're only willing to pay half of that hourly rate of, uh, or a third, or you pick your number. Uh, we will not pay the full hourly rate because that's more than what we typically pay. And, uh, and therein, you know, is another problem that you have to deal with. Um, I've been involved in lots of negotiations with insurance companies, uh, trying to get them to pay the full hourly rate of, you know, the, the lawyer of choice. Uh, sometimes I'm successful. Uh, sometimes the insurance company, sometimes the, the law firm of choice will agree to reduce their rate to the amount that's uh, paid by the insurance company. And sometimes it's important enough for the insured to have that lawyer of choice uh, that they will say, okay, we'll accept the amount that the insurance company is willing to pay for the hourly rate. And then we, the client, the insured will make up the difference between what the insurance company will pay and the, the hourly rate that the attorney charges. So, so that's something that uh, is, is becomes an issue uh, and can be dealt with uh, in the ways I've just suggested. Um, other issues that, that come up, um, you know, kind of right out of the blocks there. Um, you know, when you have outside counsel, uh, regardless of who's, who's selected them, who controls the process? Who controls the defense? Who controls settlement? Uh, again, you have to look to the policy. A lot of times they spell out some of these things, but many times the insurance company has the right to control the defense. Um, they have the right to uh, decide if and when to settle and for how much. So, uh, so those are issues that you got to be familiar with. Look at the policy and figure out who, who's in charge uh, in each of these cases. And uh, a couple of other things that come up is uh, 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 billing guidelines. Uh, for those uh, listening who aren't familiar with insurance company billing guidelines, uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm being, I'm being uh, uh, facetious there. Uh, billing guidelines can be very frustrating. Um, uh, most insurance companies now, when you select the counsel, your counsel, and uh, they're going to be defending you, uh, and the insurance companies can be paying some or all of their their uh, rate. They will say, okay, but and here's our billing guidelines that your uh, lawyer has to follow. And it's usually a fairly thick document, and it talks about 
all the things the insurance companies will pay for and those things they won't pay for. And they'll set up other rules and guidelines along the way. And it's important to review those right up front. Um, uh, and because there is some pushback and negotiation that can take place with respect to billing guidelines. I think, I think the law is now pretty clear that insurance companies typically have the right to issue billing guidelines um, as long as they don't interfere with the professional judgment of the, law, the lawyer defending you. So uh, they can't say, uh, the billing guidelines can't say, and you only get to take three depositions uh, in any case, uh, because if, if a lawyer says, well, wait a minute, I, I need to take 10 depositions here, um, courts would find that, that those billing guidelines and the insurance company inter are interfering with the proper defense. And uh, so there've been court cases about this and uh, courts have said that's inappropriate. Um, but there's other instances where you can review those billing guidelines and perhaps uh, they say, we do not pay for any conferences among lawyers uh, within a firm. And maybe you can push back and say, Look, in a, in a small dog bite case, uh, maybe you don't need to have conferences among lawyers, uh, but in a, a, a very uh, you know, difficult, sophisticated, uh, complex class action lawsuit where we're going to have a team of lawyers, obviously there's got to be you know, conferences amongst those lawyers and you know, insurance company, you should pay for that. So you should be, identify the issues within the billing guidelines, see what you can negotiate with the insurance company. And then also make sure, uh, if you're the client, uh, that your lawyers are familiar with the guidelines and, com and comply with those that, uh, you know, that they have to comply with. Well, very good. Um, we often also deal with some conflicts when we're trying to settle the case, where the insurer uh, has one view of settlement and the uh, insured has a different view. Um, and then in some of those instances, the coverage issues can sort of uh, become part of the discussion on settlement if there's a reservation of rights. Have you have you experienced that in your uh, practice? Yes, actually, yeah. Uh, various conflicts that can come up, and and the other one we should talk about briefly in, in a minute is the Cumis Council issue uh, that I know you and I have talked about in the past. But let, let me address your your other question first. Yeah, I mean, they, I've seen it come kind of both both ways here uh, where there's conflicts that come up with respect to settlement. Uh, perhaps it's a case where the insured desperately wants to settle early on because maybe because of publicity, uh, maybe because it's a they have a good relationship with whoever sued them and uh, it's a you know a vendor uh, you know uh, owner relationship or something where you want to preserve the relationship and so you want to make them whole with the using the insurance company's money. And the insurance company may say, well, no, 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 we, we don't care about publicity, uh, bad publicity you might face here. We don't care whether this may ruin the relationship with whoever's suing you. Uh, we think we've got a good defense. We're going to fight this out uh, and, and uh, regardless of the consequences. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's a situation where you, you know, each one is, is unique, but you got to look to, again, one, the policy to see what the policy says about who controls settlement. And there can be all sorts of different terms uh, within the policy that, uh, uh, that could affect uh, that, that control. But you can also look at the, the law of the state that would be applying to this, relation, this insurance relationship. And this might be a situation where you have a bad faith claim, uh, uh, where you, know, you, you have an opportunity to settle and the insurance company says, no, we're going we're gonna to fight this to the death. And even if at the end of the day, if we lose, your judgment could be, you know, are higher than the limits of our policy. Well, that may be a classic bad faith claim that you'd have against the insurance company. And what you can do there to try to get some leverage is, is to assert that bad faith, perhaps not in a lawsuit right out of the blocks, but uh, uh, in, in, a, in a demand letter or what we call a hammer letter to the insurance company that says, look, we have the opportunity to settle. Defense counsel says we should settle. There's liability here. And if we don't settle, we could get hit with a judgment above verdict. And so, uh, and if that happens and you refuse to settle, we're going to be looking to you to make us whole for that amount that would be above the policy limits. So uh, just, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's a, a not unusual for that kind of issue to come up. And I counsel 
uh, Dorsey lawyers and, and clients all the time on how to deal with that, that conflict issue. Anytime you have triangulation, you have interesting issues, whether it's just a three-party case or it's a two-party case with the insurer, you really have three parties that are participating and they each have their own economic interests. And it, it, it creates some interesting dynamics, doesn't it? Exactly. Yep. And in fact, that, that sort of leads me to the Humus Council uh, issue I mentioned a minute ago, because that's, that's also created, the issue there is created by what they call the tripartite relationship amongst the insured, uh, the insurance company, and the, the lawyer or law firm that's def, uh, being asked to defend uh, the insured. And, uh, and so, as I mentioned, on occasion, and many occasions, the insurance policy allows the insurance company to, uh, gives them the duty to defend, and they have the right and duty to select counsel and to defend the case. And, uh, and so they may do that under a reservation of rights, and that reservation of rights may outline all sorts of different scenarios where the insurance company, if certain facts or certain legal things happen, the insurance company is no longer going to have a duty to defend or to indemnify. But they, at the same time, say, and we're going to pick the lawyer who's going to defend you. And the concern, as I mentioned earlier, is that, you know, the insured says, geez, you know, is, is this law firm going to be really looking out for my interests, or will they perhaps guide the case in a way that could result in the insurance company uh, getting out of coverage here. And uh, so, as, as I mentioned, this is a, you know, the, this tripartite relationship, um, different states treat it differently again. So you've got to look at the law of your state uh, to, for some guidance, but certain states will say that where there is a conflict of interest between the insurance company and the insured on a third party claim, uh, that the insured gets to select its own counsel, regardless of what the insurance policy says about selection of counsel. In those instances, the insured gets to select counsel and the insurance company has to pay. That's a nice win for the insured. That's a nice win for the insured. Um, it's, there's, there's always issues that come up, uh, even when you have this situation. Uh, it, I think that when it, this, first, this issue was first um, sort of flushed out was in California. And the case was uh, was was called Cumus was part of the name of the case, and so a lot of times people shorthand uh, this situation when you have to hi- when the insured gets to hire its own counsel uh, and, and on the insurance company's nickel uh, they shorthand it and call it Cumus counsel and uh, uh, but other states have adopted a similar uh, approach now, uh, but you do have to look to each state to determine. What does it mean to have a conflict of interest that might get you to the point where the, you know, the insured can retain its own counsel? And, uh, you know, some states uh, say, hey, if the insurance company, all it, if, if it issues a reservation of rights letter, unless it just agrees completely that it's going to cover no matter what, if it issues a reservation of rights letter, then that's enough of a conflict to give you the right to go out and select your own counsel on the insurance company's nickel. Other states, uh, such as Minnesota, where I, I do some of my practice, um, say that it, it's a reservation of let rights letter alone is not enough. Um, and what you have to demonstrate is an actual conflict between the insurance company and the insured. Uh, and only when you can demonstrate an actual conflict uh, do you have the right to go out and select your own counsel. So you've got to you do that analysis. What's the state law say? And then what does an actual conflict mean? And then even then you're really not out of the woods because I think as you and I know, uh, uh, you still may come back to that rate negotiation issue because no, um, this whole idea about the tripartite relationship and the ability to go out and select independent counsel, it's it's, the, the insurance company still can come back and say, well, yeah, but you can't pick whoever you want and we have to pay whatever hourly rate they, they claim. It's gotta be a reasonable rate and so then again, starts this fight about what's a reasonable rate, and uh, you know that whole negotiation dance may uh, may sure. have to take place. Well, as you can tell from this uh, conversation, uh, listeners, I could uh, chat with uh, Skip for a long time about insurance coverage issue, and we could continue to talk shop about commercial litigation and uh, the type of work we do. But 
at this point in our podcast, we like to turn to a segment we call the deeper dive and uh, learn a little bit more about, uh, Skip, your background, your um, uh, what what makes you tick, so to speak. And um, I have a couple of questions for you. I guess maybe the first that our listeners might like to hear is, what's a good way over the years that you've learned to strike a good uh, work-life balance? Yeah, yeah, that, well, that's a good question. And uh, I'm not sure I've ever mastered that yet. And I've been practicing for, you know, however many years it's been, uh, maybe close to 40, 35. Um, but one thing that's helped me a lot um, in the last, uh, since 2014, um, my wife and I it used to live in a, in a suburb here in, in, many, in the Minneapolis area. And I had a, a drive, about a half hour drive to work each day. And then in 2014, we moved uh, much closer to the city of Minneapolis. So I'm now two miles, uh, I'm within the city. And uh, I've taken to walking to work uh, each day. Um, uh, and that is a complete de-stressor for me uh, because no matter what kind of day I've got, um, I've got that 30 minute walk over the Mississippi River uh, to downtown Minneapolis. Uh, and then at the end of the day, the walk back and it uh, uh, even in the middle of winter, I really enjoy that. I, I try not to think about work. Uh, I try to enjoy the uh, the scenery and the city sites and uh, think about things that aren't work related. And that has been a, a tremendous uh, uh, benefit for me to, uh, to have that exercise and that mind clearing. Do you listen to music while you walk or is it the sound of the cities you, you'd like to, you like to take that in? Yep. No, that's the, the sound of the cities. Uh, for many years, I used to stop and pick up a cup of coffee, uh, uh, but uh, the, the coffee shop closed and, uh, and I haven't found another one that's open as early as I usually like to come in. So, uh, Nope, it's just a walk in and uh, and and uh, you know, kind of have the the time to uh, to clear your mind. Now, is there a temperature tolerance that if it drops below a certain degree, you're you're out on the walk, or no matter what? Pretty much, no matter what. It just mostly in the winter. It, the question is whether I put on long underwear first. Excellent. Well, uh, and also great health, great uh, investment in your longevity and health. Well, one of the things I also wanted to ask you about in the time that remains, as long as I've known you, you and your wife, Anne, have taken some of the most interesting vacations, not the typical uh, vacations to the standard places that most of us go. First of all, do you have any vacations on the horizon to one of those exotic locations? And if I could ask a compound question, which I'm sure lawyers aren't (laughs) supposed to ask um, at the same time. Um, what's, what's one of the more interesting experiences you've had in these, uh, very unusual vacations you've taken? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll take your, uh, the, the question about upcoming trips and, um, the, the one that I'm waiting to, to finalize is one that we were supposed to take a couple of years ago. Um, I, I'm on the board of Twin Cities Habitat for Humanity and, uh, I've done an international build. My wife and I went to Guatemala uh, a few years ago and built houses there with a group from from Minneapolis. And the the next trip we were supposed to take uh, for Habitat was to Nepal and uh, to build houses there. And then COVID came and interrupted that plan. And uh, so we're now, uh, Habitat's just getting back into international builds. And I'm hoping that uh, we we, uh, can, can, uh, reignite interest in the Nepal trip because I, that's the one that I'd really uh, I'd love to do because I'd like to you know maybe do a little trekking while I'm I'm in Nepal so uh, uh, so that's the you know what I'm hoping will be a good upcoming trip uh, and you're right yeah we've had some great trips in the past uh, um, Russia uh, uh, Morocco uh, China um, uh, and I would say amongst oh the, the the one that I'll I'll say is probably my my fondest memory is our trip to Africa uh where we started in Uganda Rwanda and did a gorilla trek uh up into the the mountains and uh got to see uh, gorillas uh in a you know within 50 yards away uh and then uh from there we went down to South Africa and did a uh, a walking and uh a driving safari in Kruger National Park and uh uh just the the, the memories of that trip are just phenomenal of my wife. It was very meaningful for my wife who grew up in a small farm in uh, uh, Southern Wisconsin, reading national geographic magazines and always, uh, you know, sort of thinking that someday she'd get to see some of those things. She, she 
you know, I, I saw pictures of in, in the magazines and, uh, uh, you know, she, uh, I think she, when we left South Africa, there were tears in her eyes. Amazing. Yeah. What an amazing uh, experience that must be. Well, it looks like our time is about up. Um, and I just want to return once more to our topic of insurance coverage and give you the last word, Skip. What's the one takeaway that you'd like to leave our listeners with on the issue of managing insurance coverage issues in commercial litigation? Sure. Yeah. I think the, 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 what I would want to impress upon people is the notion that insurance is an asset of your company and uh, you should treat it like that. Uh, just like, you know, your hard, you know, the, 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 your, your computers, your people, uh, your bank accounts, this is an asset that you own and you want to, you know, use it to its, its fullest. And so, you know, even before a claim comes in, be aware of what coverages you have, uh, look for holes, uh, have someone look for holes for, you know, for you and gaps, um, educate your people because even, you know, going beyond just your risk management and finance people, educate the people who will be the ones who maybe will be on the front lines when a claim comes in. Make sure they understand what kinds of coverages are out there that could respond to one of those claims. Make sure they understand what the reporting duties are, who they need to talk to. Um, so, uh, you know, we've, we've done, you know, as I mentioned earlier, policy analysis for, for, for clients and then gone out and actually done a, you know, sort of an insurance 101 to anybody who's on the front lines. And uh, I think it's really important to educate uh, uh, the employees of, of, of clients uh, on those issues so that uh, you can use your asset to the fullest. Well, that's a great word uh, to leave our listeners with. Well, Skip, thank you for your friendship and your partnership over these many years. And uh, thank you for taking the time to be a guest on our podcast. And uh, really appreciate you uh, stopping by. All right. My absolute pleasure, Kent. Good talking to you. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for listening. I'm indebted to the extraordinary team at Dorsey for making this podcast and episode possible. For resources on this and other litigation risks, go to litigationrisks.com, where more information can be found, including a book on managing litigation risk written by yours truly. Until next time, my friends, this is yet another reminder that there are a lot of sharks swimming out there in the murky waters. So swim safely. This podcast is not legal advice and does not establish an attorney-client relationship or create any duty of Dorsey & Whitney LLP or those appearing in this podcast to anyone. Although we try to assure that the content of this podcast is accurate, comprehensive, and reflects current legal developments, we do not warrant or guarantee those things. The opinions expressed in this podcast are the opinions of those appearing in the podcast only and not those of Dorsey & Whitney. This podcast is considered attorney advertising under the applicable rules of certain states.